Uh, sorry about uh, the delay in our start, in our restart. But uh, I just had to discuss with a group of people about um, their plans about translating and transliterating the DVDs into, into text and then translating them into other languages and so forth. And, um, and also what we're going to do to make sure that all of it's available for free so uh, to everybody who wants it. So um, there's a lovely core group of people who are, who are looking after transliterate or trans, basically transposing everything that's said into a readable form because I know I'm not always readable. <laughs> and, then, and then they get that and then translate that into different languages and uh, and obviously there's a lot of intellectual property that's hap that's happening too and we want to ensure that that's always available for free to everybody so um we don't want somebody coming along and deciding they want to charge a hundred dollars for it or something like that so uh, we have to have a way of making sure that happens for the moment um one thing i've noticed too there's still a fairly depressed spirit amongst you all right so so what's going on there guys it's like is it, is, it, is it this emotional stuff getting you down? What, what's happening? Can we, uh, where's the microphones again? If we, uh, if we just, yep. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm, um, this, is, this is about my partner and I. Yep. Um, and, and I've talked with her about this, you know, to, to make sure that it's okay that I kind of bring this up with everyone. No worries. Um, so I, uh, we're just, we've, we've we're really new to this, um, just learning about it as of this week. And I see that in some ways it's, it's pushing us apart. Um, right. And, and I really, um, I, I found that it, a lot of it is really true for me. And so what I've been doing, what I've been doing is really like um, kind of talking about, you know, my feelings, my emotions 24-7. Yeah. And, she, and she's absolutely sick of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and, and. I would like to find, um, you know, she says that she would like some more balance, mm -hmm. and um, I can stop talking about what I feel all the time, um, and so I just kind of, you know, like to know what you think about that, and and like something that came to mind is like, okay, we can go and take a walk. Yep. And if we're going to take a walk, then what what's going to happen is maybe maybe some fear will come up, you know, like some emotion will come up, and I'll say, okay, this is really bothering me, and I can either I can keep it inside or I can talk about it, and if I keep it inside, it's going to keep bothering me. And then it's going to start bothering her because it's bothering me. Yep. So and one choice is you can keep it inside. Yep. Right. Um, the other one is that you you can talk about it. Right. And so I and I really try to own it, you know, and say this is how I'm feeling right now. But I just it, it's I'm doing it all the time, um, and it really <laughs> seems to be bothering her. So there's I think a third option. Okay. <laughs> ah yes 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 yes. Reveal it. What I'm getting at is that often our desire to talk about something is our desire to actually involve the other person in the process of feeling it. Do you see that? So I'm not saying don't talk about it. What I'm actually saying is look at the motive. It's a bit warm in here again. Can we just have those air cons on? Um, so can you see what I'm saying about that? Um, so what, what's actually happening is oftentimes keep it inside worst possible option, obviously. You know, if you keep it inside, you're exactly right. When you keep something inside, it automatically affects everyone around without you or them perhaps even being aware, but most of the time we are sort of aware that it is occurring. But unfortunately too, when we keep it inside, we then act out lots of different things that we could easily not act out if we started to talk about it. But talking about it is only, is driven by a lot of desires that are within us. A desire that other people understand me, a desire that other people get me, that they know me, that they... So a lot of times our talking about it can actually be a heavy, heavy projection partner. Does that make sense? And the key is to, to try to stop talking about it so much and ask yourself, why am I wanting to involve my partner so much in my emotional work? And when you start doing that, you, you, you can still stay talking about it, but you start actually feeling it instead rather than just talking about it. Because and a, and a good sign of to whether this is happening is this. If you talk about it and straight away get into a causal emotion because of the talk, then that's a good that that demonstrates generally that you're not talking about it just to have someone else involved in the process. Does that make sense? 
But if you talk about it today and then you raise it again tomorrow and then again the next day and then again the next day and then again and it's talking about the same kind of thing each time, that's a high indication to you that you're actually avoiding the underlying causal emotion and wanting to involve the other person in the emotional process and, uh, and actually it's an avoidance of feeling it. So the key is the motive. Now, let's say your motive is to feel it. So let's say that is your motive. And let's say your partner's motive is that you don't feel it. What do you do then? Well, the truth is under those circumstances, it will create a separation between the two of you. Because one person has a desire, which is to feel, right? And the other person has a desire passing through them, which is to not feel. Now, that obviously creates disharmony between the two parts of the relationship. Now, at some point, one or the other has to change their viewpoint. Does that make sense? So in other words, the person who's feeling has to turn off their feelings to match the partnership again, or the person who's not feeling needs to look at the reason why they don't want to feel and allow themselves to start feeling. Now, there will be times in any relationship where one person's feeling and the other person's not feeling. Does that make sense? What do you do with those moments? Well, the, the key is to not want the other person to do what you want them to do. So, so let's say I'm the feeling person. The other person has decided to not feel at the moment. All I need to do is say to them, well, I can see that you don't want to feel some emotions. I want to continue feeling mine. So I'm going to continue feeling mine no matter what happens. <laughs> and so I keep feeling mine. Now, the other person then has a choice to make. Do they want to allow me to continue feeling mine, emotions? Or do they want to try to prevent me from feeling my emotions? Now, if they allow me, I can stay in this relationship. As soon as they prevent me, now I've got to really look at my love of self. Because if they're preventing me from feeling my own feelings, they're preventing me from being me. So therefore, I need to look at that emotionally. Now... Now, my suggestion is if, if each person doesn't project at the other the expectation to do anything, then I, who the fe I mean, the feeling one at the moment, won't project at the other person, you've got to feel. I won't say you've got to feel. right? Because they, they have free will. They're allowed to choose to not feel, right? But I also won't put up with them trying to stop me from feeling. Does that make sense? So, so when we're, with myself and Mary, what we do is this. If, if I feel from Mary that she's trying to stop me from feeling my own emotions, I will say that to her and I will actually leave. So um, in our house, we've got a house that's 500 yards away from our tent and leaving means me walking down to the tent and I stay there. It might be three days, four days, five days by myself. Right, until I can feel from Mary that she hasn't got this desire for me anymore to shut down my own feelings. It's okay for her to shut down her feelings. She's totally able to do that. But for me, it's not okay for me if she's trying to shut down mine. And vice versa, by the way, right? So if Mary is feeling something and I'm trying to get her to not feel, then I'm, I'm the person who's trying to resist the feeling that by, by not trying to get the other person to do something, I am out of harmony with divine truth and divine love then. So it just depends on how things will flow in the relationship. I can actually live perfectly in harmony with a person who's not feeling their emotions as long as that person doesn't try to shut me down from feeling mine. As soon as that person tries to shut me down from feeling mine, now our relationship is not going to be very harmonious and one of us will probably finish up going. My suggestion is if two people can stay open even to not projecting at the other person that they do anything, in other words, if each person in the relationship is completely okay with free will, to be completely okay with free will you need to have coming from you no projection or, or force going at the other person that they've got to do anything. Now, if that's coming from me and that's coming from my partner, no matter whether we're feeling or not feeling at the time, we are going to probably still have har harmony. Now, the connection might not be fantastic because obviously when one person's not feeling and one person is, 
one person will feel all these emotions that the other person not feeling. So the connection may not be very strong in that moment, but there will be harmony because we're not both trying to damage each other through our projections. But as soon as one person chooses to try to control the other person and their feelings, that's when we get way, way out of harmony in the relationship. Yeah? Now, obviously the best solution is for both people to choose to feel all the time. That's the way God created your relationship. And, and, and yourself as a person to feel all the time. And if both of you feel all the time and don't want to control the other person all the time, you'll have perfect harmony in your relationship. Um, and what if I express you know, how I'm feeling and I'm, I think that I'm really feeling it and it brings up r a really strong emotional reaction for her? Then, then let's say so you're feeling something and you then express that feeling, so whatever that is, and you tell her, she's then feeling this, you tell your partner and she's feeling something in her, the key for her is just to allow that feeling. If she allows that feeling, then she won't project anger back. Does that make sense? But if she doesn't allow that feeling, then blocks that feeling off in some way with judgment of some kind, now there will be higher likelihood of you getting anger back or resistant back, resist resistance back or whatever. That's when the damage begins. So it all depends on what I do with owning my own emotions as to how the relationship's going to go. If both parties are fully committed to, f to only owning their own emotions and not projecting the need for the other person to do anything, then when one or both of us are not feeling, we are still going to have relative harmony. As soon as one of us decides we're going to control the other person, now we have no harmony and there's going to be some pretty big fireworks after that with one or both and so that's the issue that everyone in a relationship faces my feelings are that you've been attracted for through your law of attraction there's emotions inside of each of you that need to be addressed in this law of attraction if you can stay in the relationship and address those emotions even if it's not a soulmate relationship you can stay in the relationship and address the emotions you'll work through a lot of the blockages that you have regarding relationship and regarding love of self and love of others. If, you, if one of the party chooses to not feel all the time, eventually the person who's feeling will annoy the person who's not feeling so much that the person who's not feeling will probably leave. Yeah. But the person who's feeling won't make them generally leave. And the only time the person who's feeling would actually say, no, hang on a sec, this is enough, is when the person who's not feeling projects rage and anger and shutting down emotions towards the person who's feeling. And then you would have to say, all right, my love of self dictates that I shouldn't be here for the moment. It doesn't mean it's permanent either, by the way, just for the moment. And by the way, many of, many of you feel that if your partner's not feeling that it means that they're not attracted to this truth and therefore they're not your soulmate. I am... It's totally erroneous, by the way. Many of you will have soulmates that are definitely not attracted to this truth initially because of their emotional injuries. Does that make sense? So if you judge your partner and say, oh, because she's not into what I'm into, she's not my soulmate, you may actually just be kicking your soulmate out of your life that 25 years later, you, you can't, or even two years later, you go through a lot of emotions and realise that, that she was your soulmate and you'll go, all oh, this regret will come up then. So the key is to stop trying to judge everything like that and just both let yourself feel your own stuff if you can. And, but if one of you is not feeling, then the other person needs to stop trying to make them feel. Because when you try to make anybody do anything, it's out of harmony with love. Straight away, I'm, I need to learn something inside of me if I try to force Mary into doing something. Unless the issue is about I'm getting something from Mary that is not loving and I need to love myself, then I'd need to choose to leave the situation. Does that make sense? Does that sort of answer your question? So, yeah, just be care very careful about the talking about things. Because constant talking about things doesn't mean you're dealing with it. Right? It's better than not, you know, than keeping it inside. But often the motive to talk about things is driven by this deep desire that we often have to be heard or to be listened to or 
to be acknowledged and all of those kind of emotions which are all emotions that do need to be healed within us to have a loving relationship yeah and by the way today i'm answering a lot of like what you'd call i suppose psychological type questions any of you who feel that this is the normal thing that we talk about um would be very mistaken but it's very good to answer these questions and i just want to clarify why every emotional blockage you have also blocks your connection with god so everything you shut down within yourself is also going to mean a shutdown between yourself and god at some point so it's very important to address these emotional issues if you want to have a relationship with god yeah we go up back there right behind um aj when this talking about this reminds me of my childhood when I was a little boy, I had it was mum and dad and three older brothers, mm -hmm. and um, I was the baby of the family. Mm -hmm. um, and I can remember whenever I wanted to experience my emotions, whenever I was playing or got hurt, you know, dad would shut me down, or mum would shut me down, or my older brothers would shut me down as well. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there's the other side of it as well. When I was at times quite joyful and happy. I, they, my brothers and mum and dad shut me down as well. Yes. And that's a pretty hard thing to take. Yes. Um, and I couldn't run away from my family, which I wanted to many times. Yes. Um, that's the trouble being a child, isn't it? You can't. Yeah, you can't many of leave. us want to leave home when we're four, right? We pack our bags, and <laughs> but but we can't know where to go. <laughs> go on, though. Um, so. Like, um, I've just had, like, in, in my, I feel in my heart, and I still have it now, just a huge, I guess it's anger and despair. Mm -hmm. um, it goes on and on and on, and it's just been sitting there, like, it feels like it's been sitting there my whole life. Yeah. Yeah, and I just can't, <sighs> I don't know, I just want to get it out, you know, I just want to. All right, well, let's yeah. talk about how to get it out, shall we? Let's talk about how it was constructed. And then when we can construct it, we can sort of understand the deconstruction process and then what you'll need to do to feel it, to feel your way through it. So what happened when you were little? Here's the causal emotion. So, And what happened, the causal emotion might be you were, you were either in your desire, which is a very, very good thing, or you were just in an emotional process, like where you hurt yourself, scratch yourself, cut yourself, whatever, and you're crying or whatever, just an emo feeling an emotion. So the causal thing is we're often feeling our desires, which is great, and we're also often feeling our emotions, which is also great, right? That's what's happening inside of us as a child. But then what happens is our environment, usually our parents and older siblings, because our older siblings have learnt to do it from our parents, they then judge our causal emotion which then sets up a fear of our causal emotion does that make sense so straight away now we've got a fear going on about dealing with this particular emotion or having this particular desire then what happens is the fear itself unfortunately also gets judged <laughs> by our environment and then that sets up this anger right inside of us now this wouldn't ha this will happen even when we're a child so by now we've now got anger inside of us as a child like three four five year old and we're angry inside that's why you have the period called the terrible twos you know because already there's a lot of emotional shutdown occurring by the environment that the child doesn't understand it's just reflecting and it's and it's feeling all of this judgment and all of this fear and it can't feel them because every time it tries to go into a cry or get scared everyone judges that as well and projects terrible emotions at the child because of that and so in the end the child's getting into anger and then and then we're trying to feel our anger and are we allowed to even feel that no every time i get angry what happens i get a belting or i get punished in some way or i get sent to my room or whatever so my anger now gets judged by my environment so where do i go with that right can you see that all it is is layer upon layer of judgment that finishes up creating each layer 
of emotions inside of us. Do you see that? This is what's happened inside. So now we're in this state where we're depressed and everything. And, every, and of course, everyone judges depression as well, don't they? Like you, particularly if you're a male and you're depressed. Like a female generally is normally sort of allowed to be depressed. But if you're a man and you're depressed, like, you know, that's, major, that's a major problem. And so what happens is we have judgment about that as well. And so what do we do then? We just get into this state where we're now in our mind, right? And, and usually in that state, that is the state of our highest addictive self where we're now just focusing on all of our addictions. So at this point, I'm drinking. Every night I come home, I need to have at least one drink just to relax, right? And just to feel a little bit of connection and so forth. I'm now in my mind. I'm now, I even might seek out spiritual so-called spiritual paths that are all to do with my intellectual development that will help me continue this process of suppression which is all based on judgment of the underlying layer all right so how do i get rid of this now because this is all constructed in me by my environment and this has all probably happened way 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 back in my life although now a lot of the times i am my own worst enemy with with perpetrating this towards myself now because normally I've felt every one of these judgments and I let these judgments also because of I couldn't have any other way of dealing with it I let these judgments come a part of me as well so now I judge myself for having a cry I judge myself for feeling fear I judge myself for being in anger and I have all sorts of judgments about it like being anger not not spiritual you're always going to hurt someone when you're angry. I'm afraid that I'm going to hurt someone if I express my anger. There's ways to express your anger without that. But this is all the fears that kept build up, build up, build up inside of us. Now, to undo it, can you see there's one common thread through the whole thing? What's the threat? It's the judgment of the emotion can you see that? If you can release the judgment of the emotion, then all of the emotions will start flowing as your soul can handle them. Can you see that? If, if I can release this judgment of the emotion, the only problem is, is the whole world is judging the same emotions you're judging. So there's a lot of blockages to release about. Oh, what is everyone going to think of me doing that? What is... Do you know what I mean? They're all judgments that are constructed because we're now living in this world that is so detuned from their emotional state, their true emotional state, and have so much judgment about all sorts of things that in the end we never get to our causal emotion again. So my suggestion firstly is to look at your judgments. They all came from your childhood. They all came from places that were very, very damaging towards you. A child feels a judgment as a terrifying experience, right? And you will notice that when you start noticing the judgments of others come at you and really, and so instead of getting out of the mind and, in, and instead you get back into allowing people's judgments to hit you. See, what we do, we, we don't do this very often. What we do instead is we say, yeah, mum judged me, but that's what she's always like. So what did we just do? We just skipped over the fact that we got judged again by mum. Now mum might be 70 and I might be 40 and mum just judged me the same way she did 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, in fact the same way she did all my life pretty much and I just say, well that's mum and sure that's mum but the judgement is not truth you know, and I need to stop explaining away these things and often we explain them all away by just saying little comments like, oh, yeah, but, you know, they can't change or they're too old now. or that. And we give ourselves all these excuses to not feel the judgment. If we can't feel the judgment, we are never going to get to the emotion. So, for example, if my mother says to me, um, oh, I'll give you an example of what happened last week while I was with her. How's that? We were sitting down for dinner 
And uh, my father um, says to me, um, I'm going to pray for our meal. Is that all right? I said, yeah, it's your house. You're allowed to do what you like, <laughs> right? And mum says, oh, but we're praying through Jesus' name, right? And I go, yeah, no worries. I understand that. <laughs> right. And then, and then she made a condescending remark to me about that, about me believing that I'm Jesus, right? Now, what do I feel in that particular state? So what do I feel is some con condescension coming at me. Now, I could say, oh, yeah, that's mum, you know, she just doesn't believe I'm Jesus and, and uh, or she's uncertain. The best way to put it, she's uncertain, of course. So, so she's uncertain and she likes to make fun of it occasionally and, and, and she thinks it's a bit of a laugh, you know. So, so that's the – and she's also quite afraid, of course, about me saying that I am too, but that's a different issue. Now, I can say all of these feelings that she has – and dismiss totally my own emotional reaction, which is I've just attracted my mother being condescending towards me again. How does that feel? Does that make sense? And in that moment, what do I do with that condescension? Like I need to feel it. I need to feel that condescension enter me and feel what it triggers inside of me. What does it feel like? Ah. You know, this is where my definition of myself about women has come from, this condescending projection. By the way, before I was saying I was Jesus, she was still treating me condescendingly at different times. Does that make sense? She just now has another good reason to do it. Right? And your parents will often have reason after reason after reason after reason to do what they continue to do with you too, exactly the same. What I need to do is feel the judgment. When I feel the judgment, I can feel, wow, well, you know, that's pretty nasty really in the end. And when I go deeper into that, how do I feel you know, grieving-wise about that? You know, so when, when I was just sitting there, I just felt that flush of like self-judgment about, oh, you know, again, my mother saying that I'm not worthy to be who I say, I'm saying I am, you know, and allow myself to feel this own, the triggered emotion, which is this feeling of unworthiness, and allow it to come up in me. You know, I don't even need to say anything to her, really. But, uh, but most of the times I, I finish up saying something. But, but I can just feel the emotion rise in me. When you allow yourself to feel the judgment, you'll realise how powerful the judgment is to condemn you, how powerful that judgment is in shutting you down emotionally. Right? And when you allow yourself to feel the judgment, you'll go back down these lists. So once you stop judging your anger, you will allow your anger to be present. Now, that doesn't mean you go around yelling and screaming at everyone. It means that every time you're angry, you say, hey, sec, I'm angry, and you'll run out to the bag and bash, 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 you know, and give it a good thumping and, you know, and then connect to what's the fear underneath maybe and then maybe the tears, right? But there's all this childhood anger that's just sitting there, right, just sitting there waiting to be expressed and nobody's ever let it express because you got judged. And by the way, let's say what judgment really is. Judgment is really punishment, Right. So instead of judging, you could just write down there, I'm punishing. So in other words, I'm about to cry, punish the crying. Not allowed to cry. You, you just stop a person from crying by punishing the crying, don't you? Many of you have been punished for your tears. As an adult, you get punished quite easily by saying, oh, you're not crying again, are you? That's a punishment, isn't it? That's basically saying to you that your tears are not acceptable, right? Or, oh, you're crying again. Aren't you stupid again? Oh, why can't you get on with your life? Why? You know, all these different judgments all are punishments. Try, someone trying to punish you for actually feeling something they need to feel inside of themselves, usually. But this is what the parent does. It punishes the child for the emotion that it is denying, the parent's denying within itself. That creates the next layer of emotions, which then the, the parent generally punishes, right? So when a child's just sitting there afraid because they can't go for a swim in the pool, what does the parent eventually do? Right, they shame them and they, you know, ah, oh, you're a weakling or whatever, you know, or, or they try to reward systems and all sorts of things to get them to jump in the pool, all of which generally are controlling. And so what happens 
in the end, instead of dealing in truth, we have this feeling of judgment about that. And then we get into our anger. What does the parent do with anger? The child's kicking and screaming. What does the parent normally do with anger? Normally physical abuse, isn't it, generally? Corporal punishment, we call it. It's punishment. And, and really, this is the way the world has come to control you by having a punishment and reward based system. So in other words, I don't love you all the time. I only love you when you're doing everything that I judge to be right and nothing for which I feel you should be punished for. That's the only time I'm going to love you. Right? And all of us are brought up in this system, generally. It's very rare in a family to not be brought up in this system. So what happens is I'm brought up in this reward-based, punishment-based system. And so whenever I have a, an emotion or a feeling that everyone says is good, then I get rewarded with love, in quotation marks, because it's not real love. And then whenever I have an emotion that everyone views as bad, then what I do is I get punished for having that emotion. And what we need to do is stop this process within ourselves, firstly, so you need to stop punishing yourself for feeling depressed. You need to stop punishing yourself for feeling anger. You need to stop punishing yourself for feeling afraid. Do you see what I'm saying? If you can stop this part of this happening, this will naturally unravel itself. Because every one of these is the thing that's locking this up. Does that make sense? So that's locking that up. This is locking that up. It's the punishment and judgment that's locking everything up. And if I can reduce that. And so, so stop judging people for feeling their emotions. Someone's in a rage. Stop saying to yourself or to anybody else, oh, isn't it bad? He's in a terrible rage. Well, you know, judge him for that rage. No, no, no. He's good. He's good at in rage. It's just a pity that he doesn't deal with it with the bag or with something else instead of yelling at somebody. But it's actually better that he's there than he's there because he's just got another less layer of judgment to deal with in that place. And it's better if I'm there than in there. I've got a less layer. So how many of us feel fear is okay in others or in ourselves? Not many really actually. You know, we get quite frustrated with fear in somebody. You try seeing a little three-year-old child that's afraid to do something that you want it to do and you see your own reaction to that. And many of us get really upset, frustrated, angry because like, we want the child to do something different but the child's just afraid, right? And so if we can stop this process of punishment and judgment and reward systems and so forth and just get back to loving every emotion that we need to feel all the emotions will just start popping up naturally. So that's what I feel needs to happen for yourself, is to, is to look at all of the emotions associated with punishment and judgment and allow yourself to feel about them. And then just a, once, once you feel about them, they release from you. And when they release from you, you are allowed to feel depressed. So I started in my emotional processing where I felt depressed for ages. Like about, it was about a year and a half I felt depressed. Didn't get much else, didn't get any anger, didn't get anything. But then when I stopped pu punishing myself and judging myself for it, I stepped down into the uh, underlying emotion. And you'll be able to do that each time. Yep. And it's this, this punishment and judgment that comes from the parents, from the environment, not just your parents, but also from your environment, right? Yeah. Is that, that, does that help? Yeah, thanks, AJ. Yeah. Yep. We come down to Raya down, down here. AJ, um, my modus operandum always was um, <clears throat> excessive hilarity, uh, mischievousness, playfulness, um, and it was a modus operandum, and it managed to keep them all confused and away from me, mm -hmm. kind of? Mm -hmm. Where is that? Is that up at the top with the mind? Um, no. What, uh, in, in this process, obviously, what I've described here is a general process of major 
major emotions. But what often happens with ju judgment is that a certain emotion in us is judged by our environment. That's where everything begins. And then what we do is we have a number of learned responses to cope with that judgment. One of the learned responses is humour. So what we finish up doing is a lot of people will become like always jokers. They're always joking, always joking. And the always joking is based upon our fear. It's, it's about avoiding our fear but not feeling anger. Does that make sense? So yeah. what we do is we judge, we ju where our environment has judged and punished our causal emotion, then it's judged and punished our fear, and then we've learned, all right, fear is judged and punished, but humour is never judged or punished generally. Right. right. So what do we do with that? We then go down the track of always being funny, always being humorous, always you know, laughing and doing funny things and strange things to cheer up everybody around us. And it's a great way to get everybody out of their emotions. But it's also a great way to receive approval. Mm. Because, no, of course, nobody's going to punish or judge humour. It's very rare for anybody to say, actually, do you realise you just skipped over an emotion by having that joke? You know? right, right. Very rare for anybody to say that to you. So what they do is they reward you. So it's part of the reward system. Remember, a punishment and judgement system is also based on rewards. And the rewards are... Emotional rewards for behaviour that's acceptable. Okay. And, and there's a large emotional reward on this planet for humour-based behaviour. Okay. Right? And the reason why is because everybody wants to avoid the real emotions oftentimes that are going on. Now, I'm not saying that all humour is caused by the suppression of negative emotion. Just like I'm not saying that all grief is caused by the suppression of the negative emotion either because you can be grieving while you're joyful, mm. right? But what I am saying is that when we set up in our childhood this reward-punishment system that is implied upon us, what finishes up happening is we learn to do exactly what's rewarded and we learn to avoid those things that we're going to be punished with. So it became a, a survival mechanism in my mature years. Yes, yep. And it would have become a survival mechanism even earlier, perhaps. Right, but yep. I really see it now. Yeah. And the key is to look at when you're kicking into the survival, because whenever you're kicking into the mechanism, you are avoiding a fear. Right. Right. So there'll be times in the future where you will be humorous, but, and it will be really felt, and there'll be other times where you're bringing up a joke or something like that in order to avoid a feeling. It's nervous, yeah. So a nervousness or, you know, you're in a group of people and you don't know what to say, so you tell them a joke or, do you know what I mean? In mm. order to cheer everybody up or make them feel happy. So just notice within you when you're in this reward-based system that's being created and when you're in this punish-based system that's being created okay. inside of you. And be, be aware too that... All of this, we don't have to judge all of this because all of this is actually created by our environment. If, if our environment didn't have this reward-punishment system but actually gave you love no matter what you did, then would you, you know, if you were crying, would you ever be projected at? No. If you were fearful, would you ever be projected at? No. Right? You'd just be allowed to experience it and it would be released from you wouldn't even carry it around anymore you'd be completely different and you certainly wouldn't be oh, i'm afraid so what can i say that's really uh, going to make everybody relax you know mm -hmm. you wouldn't be in that mode because you'd want to feel your fear seems like i learned it when i was just a wee little kid it worked at some time maybe when i was yep. three or four yep. and then it just always worked yep and it works a lot you you think of every single system that's being created in you worked probably from that age probably did yeah. right so and this is why they're so hard to access as an adult because as an adult we're far removed from that place of complete feeling that the four-year-old child is in and yeah. we create these systems and maintain these systems now out of self-protection yeah okay mm. thank you um if we just go over here and then up the back um I've got actually two questions. Um, one is when I started to process a few months ago, every time I, I was crying, I was crying because my love attraction showed me something or I was intellectually um, feeling something. Or And these days, sometimes I cry. I even wake up and I just want to cry or things like that. And I don't really know why. 
So it's actually, I feel it's not wrong, so I just cry and, and I'm fine after it's a while. Very but good. It's very it's, good. It, that's, my question is, I am going somewhere when I cry when I don't know why I'm crying? Yes. Or am I, I don't know, you know, if I'm really dealing with something or not? Well, when you're crying, even if you don't know what you're cry crying about, what's actually happening is causal emotion is allowed to flow in you without judgment of what it's about. And that's a very good sign that you're actually allowing your emotion to flow. That's, that's a very positive sign. A, cry, a child does that and it's great when you do that. That's the way I feel sometimes. I wake up and I'm like, as usual, it's okay. And I'm like, no, it's not okay. <laughs> and I just cry. Yeah. And yeah. it's just a bit weird because I, I, I don't have a clue what's happening. Yeah, and the key is to not try to have a clue what's happening. Okay. And uh, my second question was... Um, I find it's really hard to connect with myself because the first thing is I don't really know who I am anymore. But then during the day, you know, I be with people and suddenly I've got a feeling, right, I got disconnected again. So I don't want to be with people again. I just want to be on my own. Mm -hmm. So more and more I just want to be alone. But I don't know if that's kind of avoiding maybe some feelings or if that's good just to take the time to be on my own and try to connect with what I feel. Is like, I don't... Let, let's sort of describe it. So here's yourself. Sorry about the diagram. It's not really what you look like, is it? No. But there's you. And what's, what you're doing is you're, you're in a connected space. So in a connected space, initially, what's happening is all of your emotion is flowing straight through you. So when you feel like crying, you cry. When you feel like laughing, you laugh. When you feel like you know, jumping around, you jump around. You don't shut anything down. It's just like a child. Don't shut anything down. Now in that connected space... What happens is your environment will judge you or whatever and that will cause you to want to block it at something at some point. There will be a fear come up in you or some kind of anger or other emotion but you always cause through this system of reward punishment that, that finishes up creating a blocking emotion inside of you. And in that space you no longer feel connected to yourself in that place. Now when you're no longer connected to yourself you are also no longer connected to anyone in your environment, really. From that moment on, every interaction you're having with every single person, including yourself, is fake. Okay. Right? but And that's what you feel. You feel that disconnected feeling, right? Uh, it's like everything is flat. I, like if I win someone, yep. even at work or at home, sometimes I just feel like, oh, I'm here, but actually I just want to be alone. Yes. So sometimes it, it's t still really hard to, to tell myself, then go on, then go and lay down in your bed and be on your, you know, by yourself. More and more I'm able to do it. But then I'm thinking, that's going to be always like this, like, you know, like being on your own because you actually feel better just to connect with yourself. Or you one you see day how are we the judgment kicks in. The judgment's now kicking in. You're now judging being by yourself as, ah, oh, that's not, that's antisocial. You know, what are other people going to think of me doing this, withdrawing all the time, all those kind of things. What will happen initially is you'll need to spend quite a lot of time alone in order to connect to yourself emotionally. Just to give an example in my own life, um, I took Mary down and we visited at my accountant. My, now, my accountant has known me for like uh, about probably 12 years now. Right? And so he saw me before all of this emotional processing began and he's seen me afterwards. And what he noticed was about six years ago when I, when I really come face to face with all of the Jesus type emotions, I spent long periods of my life without talking to anybody and by myself. And everybody around me, including my business friends and business partners and all those things that I had at the time, got very freaked out about that. And they'd go along to my accountant and they'd tell my accountant, that something's going on with AJ, you know, I don't know what's up with him anymore. He's just withdrawn from everybody, which is not the case. I didn't withdraw from everybody. I just knew that it was impossible for me to discuss this emotions with anybody I knew without getting judgment and therefore impossible for me to feel these emotions in their presence. Does that make sense? So what I did was I stepped back and felt those emotions myself. Now, everyone around me at the time even spoke to my own accountant about what I was doing. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because they become concerned and they become, you know, what's he doing now and so forth. And all that is is just judgment about me spending time alone in order to deal with something. That's all it is. Yeah. Now, 
if they understood that if I wasn't connected to myself, how could I be connected to them? They'd have some. They'd say, "Go for it. Be alone for as long as it takes for you to get connected to yourself again." Now, when you get connected to yourself again, what will happen is you'll feel like you can be yourself more and more when you're with other people. So, so the problem for most of us is that. We're, we're with other people when we start, but we're with other people in a very disconnected way. We're in a, with, it, with other people in a very addictive way too. So we're, we're quite addicted to the emotions we get from them. They're addicted to the emotions they give us and so forth. And we're in this really codependent type of relationship. Now when we step back from that and step out of that relationship, the people around us generally will judge us and we'll probably have quite a lot of time that we need to have alone in order to reconnect with what, who am I really? What's really going on for me? What's the feeling I need to feel here? What's the emotion I'm feeling? And after a while you get so used to feeling your own emotions when you're by yourself, you then start, automatically this happens by the way, you feel like you're reintroducing yourself to society almost, right? And, and what happens is you start being yourself in front of other people. And then whenever you can't do that, you withdraw a little again and get yourself back again and then you're back in front of other people again and so forth. And what you finish up doing is, is eventually it cycles. Like you're with the people, you get triggered with something, disconnect, so you get back away, you feel the emotion, ah, reconnect and then I'm with people again and so forth. And then after a while what happens is your own, through your own development is you'll be able to stay connected with yourself fully no matter who you're with and what environment you're in. Even if you're being tortured, you will stay in that place with yourself. Thank Even you. if you're being laughed at, ridiculed, whatever, you will stay in that place with yourself. And that's really a strong place of self-love uh, when you're in that place. Initially, it takes a lot of processing emotionally to get from the place where you were before to that place. And so don't be afraid about the process. Don't judge yourself for withdrawing uh, to deal with something. Thank you. Yep. Up the back, Gave. Thanks, ladies, for doing that for us. <laughs> Thank you, AJ, for your teachings. <laughs> and I will apologize for all the doubts. <laughs> that I am projecting onto you. <laughs> you don't need to apologize for it. <laughs> you just need to feel it. You changed my whole life. And <laughs> but sometimes you feel, Simon, that it's not for the better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is my pleasure. Simon, uh, a few weeks ago, by the way, it was at Woodford and the Folk Festival. And you did a bit of a presentation, didn't you, there about the divine truth path and how it's affected your life? And yeah, but I was also afraid to say that you are Jesus. <laughs> so I just spoke about emotions. Yeah, but it was awesome that you did because actually one of our friends was listening to you at the time. Not anybody who comes along to this session. That just their law of attraction was they finished up being at Woodford at the time, listening to you talk about the divine truth path and emotions. Which was awesome. It's my passion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The key for yourself, Simon, is always going to be this connection you have with spirits and what you allow them to feel through you. Because at the moment what's happening quite a lot still is that spirits are connecting very easily to some of your, some of your feelings and expressing their emotion through you. And so, so a lot of the grief you're feeling is actually not your own grief. And the, it, the, my suggestion is to look at what's going on emotionally. There's a desire for this connection to spirits uh, because of what it gives you in some way. So if you can look at that emotionally and perhaps we can talk about what that emotion is uh, privately, but there's a, there's a desire there. So if you can allow yourself to do that, you'll find that you'll become more and more stable emotionally as you, as you work your way through your own emotions. Because at the moment you're quite heavily influenced by spirits still affecting those emotions. So if you, when you're feeling like you're feeling right now, if you can just allow yourself to breathe, stay really connected with yourself and then ask yourself whether this is a spirit's emotion or your own, you, you'll feel quite different with the two different types of emotion and just allow yourself to feel the difference. 
right. So, so do you feel it was a spirit who was expressing what you just expressed to me, or do you feel it was you? No, I feel that it wasn't me. Okay, yeah. Um, can you feel the hook that you have into that spirit? Can you feel what, why you allow the spirit to express himself through you? No. So that's the key thing to go into next, is to just look at what's the emotional reason. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if you, if you can allow yourself to look at the emotional reason why you allow them to connect. And by the way, many of you do this at times with anger. Where, where you're actually expressing anger, oh, where you're actually expressing the anger, um, but it's not actually your own anger you're expressing very much of. It's some spirit's anger that you're expressing that's connecting through you. And often we have deep emotional reasons why we allow different spirits to connect through us in that way, even in an unconscious manner. And a lot of those emotions are based upon things like, for instance, wanting approval from a man or wanting approval from a woman. In your case, I feel there's a male spirit who you want, you want approval from men and so male spirits are easily able to connect through you because you've got this connection going out to spirits saying, connect through me, connect through me. It makes me feel better when a man takes an interest in me. Does that make sense? When you heal that emotion, those men won't be as attracted to doing it and therefore you won't feel as emotionally unstable. That make sense? I'm not here. Yeah. And stay, stay breathing with yourself. Um, who else was had their hand up? If we can come up the, up the back there, yeah, and then down to the other. Thanks. Hey, Jay, with what you've just been discussing there about what we do to our children, mm -hmm. as well as working on your own stuff to, you know, clear that. Mm -hmm. Is there any value in... I have an 18-year-old daughter mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I've done all this to her. Yeah, yeah. Is there any value in discussing what I've learnt today with her and an apology? Yes. And say, I am going to work on this and I'm so sorry... I didn't realise what I was doing. Yep. And yeah. Huge value in this. Huge value. When a parent acknowledges the damage they've done to the child, it allows the child to start seeing the truth about the damage. And then that allows them to start experiencing their emotions that have been quite shut down over that period of time. So, so even you just acknowledging it, the person may not choose to be on the divine path, but you just acknowledging it yourself as a parent causes the child to actually start processing through emotion and you'll notice a huge difference mm. in, in the person, no matter what age, by the way, even if they're adult, like 30 or 40, mm. and you acknowledge these things. And it also it's very powerful for yourself because there are also some forgiveness of yourself begins. Mm. Forgiveness of self can't begin until you acknowledge what you've done. You know, you can't blanketly forgive yourself until you actually know what you've done that needs to be forgiven. Does that make sense? Mm. And that happens at an emotional level. So when you begin to acknowledge the things you've done, there's also this feeling of repentance that comes from your soul and that, that then calls God into the picture generally and, and you can start forgiving yourself for what you've done as well and that's a, that causes you then to not act out of guilt in the future. Because what, what a lot of parents do is they see all of this stuff that's happened that they've projected on their children and instead of allowing the child to feel about it and then them feeling about their own emotions about what they've created, what they do instead is they start feeling, oh boy, there's terrible feelings of guilt. I've done that too and I've done that too and then I've done that too. And so then what we start doing is trying to fix that like by giving the child things or allowing the child to, to treat us unlovingly or you know what I mean? And in the end that actually makes it worse. Mm. We're better off actually just feeling the emotions ourselves, encouraging our child and toil the truth to our child and then everything starts opening up quite a lot then. That's good because she's very open to yep. to listening and she's an amazing forgiving person. And Children are, right? Yeah. yeah. And I've, I've known with myself since she was, you know, quite little, I can pinpoint times when I've lost it. Yeah. And it's usually, it's been my own stuff. I've known that I've been 
trying to get to work on time or I've been busy and yeah. she's a real, you know, for want of a better word, dreamer and dawdler and it doesn't Which work. Which is your law of attraction, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work with trying to get somewhere on time. Yeah. And I've carried a lot of guilt for times when I've, you know, really got angry with her. She's been little. Yeah. And, you know, I had no right to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's good to, to acknowledge that as a parent and actually acknowledge that directly to your child. That's very mm, powerful. That's good. Thank you, Ajay. Yeah, very powerful. And we were down with Barbara, weren't we, down? Yeah. Thanks, so. Left side getting lots of action there. So. Left side, left side. Yeah. <laughs> AJ, a few weeks ago I had a few hours of ironing to do and I decided I was going to put music on and lighten it up. Okay? Uh, yeah. So I put in my iPod that's yeah. got all of your downloads on it as well, but yeah. I chose music. Yeah. Okay, it plays the first song and I'm happy yeah. and on comes an AJ tape. <laughs> <laughs> and I, said, I don't want to listen to AJ, I want to listen to music. So I go back over and I put it back on again and it plays another son, song and once that song's finished, comes back AJ. Oh. <laughs> You've got electronic problems too. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> I, so that happened a few times. In yeah. the end, I said, oh, I might as well listen to this. Yeah. So I did. And in listening to it, I obviously um, needed to listen to it. It was about emotions. I don't know which tape it was. Yeah. But I recall, and my question is, are you holding out on us? Because <laughs> I recall something like, um, while you, somebody asked you the question and you said while you were sleeping, you'll be amazed at the things that you can do while you're sleeping. So my question is, while we're sleeping, <laughs> can I learn French and can I deal with my emotions? Um, you can do both. But you can't deal with your awake state emotions in your sleep state. You need to deal with your awake state emotions in your awake state. You can deal with lots of sleep state emotions in your sleep state. Now, let me what's the difference? What's the difference, yeah. When you're asleep, you often observe things happening in your life, in your own life, that are very damaging to you and cause you lots of grief. For instance, every woman that's ever been cheated on has ob often observed the act in her sleep state. So you imagine, not only do you know... So this is why many women wake up with the feeling, oh, my husband's cheating on me, right? It's because they've actually physically observed the act in their sleep state. Right? Now that sleep state grief can be handled in your sleep state. Does that make sense? How could you choose to do that though in your sleep well, state? Well, um, you would automatically be choosing to do it properly right now. As soon as most people get on the divine love path and become focused on dealing with their emotions, they start processing huge amounts of emotion in their sleep state. And in fact, you, many of you have already processed almost all of your sleep state emotions in your sleep state, even though many of you feel quite stuck in the awake state. Right? And the reason why that's the case is because in your sleep state, you are, have a lot more openness to truth and a lot less resistance to what might not be true. So in other words, in your sleep state, you know that emotional processing works. In your awake state, you still may have very much resistance to it, to dealing with it, because you can't see the benefits in your awake life yet. Does that make sense? In your sleep state, you know there's a spirit world. In your awake state, you still might have doubts. Right? In your sleep state, you've probably already experienced divine love flow into your soul. In your awake state, you probably haven't experienced it that much if you're quite blocked emotionally. Do you see what I'm saying? In your sleep state, you may know who I really am. In your awake state, you still haven't sorted that out yet. You're right? In your sleep state, you've got all these different beliefs that can be resolved quite rapidly because you have the ability in your sleep state to resolve them by travelling to locations, examining things, talking to people. So many of you have already talked to my friends from the first century, for example. So you would know the ones who know me. <laughs> and they know and identify me. In your awake state, that's not possible. So how do you resolve these questions that you have about my own character and nature? You can't really, unless by, by you observe and you deal with it emotionally. So can you see in your sleep state, you can actually process quite a lot of stuff that in your awake state, due to the circumstances that we have here, and, and often because of those circumstances, the lack of faith we have here, we often don't get to process them in our awake state for some time. Many times we set up 
events also in our sleep state that we then that are there to help us in the awake state to access the emotion that we know. So at night time we could be planning. Our next day's law of attraction. Most of you are already doing that. Yeah, planning your next day's law of attraction in your sleep state. And the reason why is because you want yourself to be able to start dealing with these emotions in your awake state. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the, be the beauty of doing this is that, is that you can process a lot of emotion in your sleep state, but you cannot process the emotions in your sleep state that were created in your awake state. And that's where we've got to do the work here. Now, the reason why is because of a lot of our emotions are actually the physiolog physi physiology of a lot of emotion is that we've stored it in the soul, but there's a physical link to the soul and the, the problem in our spirit body and our problem in our physical body. And unless we start dealing with our awake state emotions, we won't release everything. Also, a lot of times our actions in the awake state are totally opposite to truth and love, which cause their additional problems. And if you don't learn the lessons in your awake state, you often continue in disharmony with regard to lessons in love, which then causes future damage in your awake state. So this is why the awake state processing is so important for you if you want to stay on earth, obviously. Now, as soon as you, pro as soon as you uh, progress into the spirit world, and as soon as you pass, in other words, what happens is that because your physical body is now just an organism laying on the ground that no longer is emotionally connected to your soul, what happens now is you have a recollection of all of your sleep and awake state stuff in the spirit world which means you start going through a lot of your awake state emotions from the earth in a conscious manner. And you remember your sleep state experience when you pass, or you, and usually shortly after you pass. Many of you, when you pass, will, will very, very easily remember your sleep state experiences as soon as you pass. And that's uh, a very powerful thing in terms of triggering all of these things about the blockages that we have in our awake state. Because the only reason why our emotion isn't flowing in our awake state right now is because of all the blockages we have to it in our awake state. And they are usually blockages of emotional beliefs that are, that are now in our soul. The blockages like, how do I know if there's a spirit world? How do I know if God exists? How do I know if emotional processing actually works? All of these things can easily be tested in your sleep state in a spirit form, but are much, much more difficult to test in the awake state and see with your own eyes the results. You'll have to fe learn to feel the results in the awake state. And most people, that's where most people have a lot of trouble. We don't trust what we feel. And so therefore we don't, we don't allow ourselves to notice the changes that we're making in our feeling. Does that make sense? Whereas in the sleep state, you can observe the emotion actually leaving you as a colour. And so it's much easier for you now to trust that that's actually happening. You see? But in your awake state, when you're crying about something and you see this colour come out of you, you, you don't see a colour coming out of you in your awake state, but you do in your sleep state. So in your awake state, you don't know whether the causal emotion is leaving you in that instant. Does that make sense? Unless you trust your feelings. And this is where trusting your feelings in your awake state is so important. Because it's your feelings that will drive the truth in your awake state. In the sleep state, you have a lot better ability to investigate truth through metaphysical means than you do in your awake state. That's why spirits in the sleep state often do progress faster once they know the truth from the earth because they know how to trust the relationship between the metaphysical and the emotion. On earth, if you can learn to trust the emotion first above everything else, your spirit world progression is just going to be like rapid as rapid as it could possibly be. But if on earth you're trying to always look for metaphysical manifestations of your emotion, then on the spirit world you're going to try to do the same and you're going to be very blocked emotionally. Does that make sense? Hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, can we go up to... Hi, Dave. How are you? Just staying with the um, um, sleep state stuff. I had a... I, I very rarely dream. And um, I had one... Um, last week maybe and I was I was waiting table over a big chasm and um, I had to get to the other side and I went past these two guys and I said 
don't stand up because I'll fall. And they stood up. And I fell and I was really frightened. I was in terror. And I'm not sure whether I woke up, but I come out of the dream. Mm-hmm. And immediately I was back at the beginning of the dream. I was waiting table. I went past these two guys. I said, don't stand up because I'll fall. And they did. And I went. And this time, um, it's, I was more relaxed and it seemed to go on forever. I hit the floor and I just floated above it and just got on with whatever it was. And I just felt so comfortable in doing that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, my question is, uh, was, was I overcoming fear mm. and terror through that? Yeah, and there's two fears actually. Can you see what they were? Um, letting go. Yep. And? Asking someone not to stand up. <laughs> yeah, in other words, feeling afraid about other people's actions towards you. Oh, right. Mm. So um, while that happened in your dream, that must have been obviously some sleep state stuff you needed to work through, that also probably needs to be addressed in your wake state too, where you're afraid of other people's reaction to you and what you know how their, their choices affect your life. So have a look at that as an emotion. And then also have a look at an emotion of where of where you're trying to control things rather than allow things in your awake state life. Yeah. Um, hey, Eche. Just lately I feel a strong spirit influence on me. Mm-hmm. And I've been in the natural love past for about 13 years. I'm mm-hmm. pretty strong in it. Yep. And I, I just feel like this, there's some spirits around me they they just don't want me to go on the on the divine love path. Mm. It's just just happening yep. a couple yep. of days. It feels pretty. I feel them all the time, and especially when I go asleep. Yep. They it feels like they come and they're with me and try to. It's quite amazing to watch, yeah. and but I feel this is kind of going on my heart. Something with my heart is... Um, yeah. <sighs> yeah, it's just... So if you can remember firstly that everything is a law of attraction. Yeah. So, so when we've got spirits on the natural love path trying to get us back onto the natural love path, there's a very good law of attraction event occurring for us and that is that we obviously have a desire to avoid some things emotionally. Because when you don't avoid anything emotionally, you'll get to the point where you won't attract natural love spirits very much. Now, natural love spirits hook into a number of different things. Firstly, they hook into your desire to stay in your mind rather than feel your emotions. So, so have a look at that. What's going on for you there? What, uh, is there times when you're wanting to get back into that natural love path because it felt better? Do you know what I mean? How, how many of you feel, have felt that at different times where you, you want to get back on the natural love path because this divine love stuff just doesn't... It feels pretty unsafe, right? So... so what that does when you're in those moments is you'll attract the natural love spirits who are fairly well progressed who will try to help you get back onto the natural love path. And that's a normal thing that will occur as a part of your law of attraction. Right? So part of your attraction is I want to avoid my own emotion. You're going to automatically get a spirit come to you who will help you avoid your emotion. Another thing that's happening though lately is that many of you have already made some progression with your emotions. Right, And you make some progression to your emotion until you get to these big emotions, you know, the crucial ones that start coming up. And at the crucial emotions, the ones that are large, that's when we often revert back to the same coping mechanisms we had before. Because we haven't yet given up the coping mechanism. You know, what we've done instead is we've said, all right, this divine love path sounds, stuff sounds really good. It resonates with my soul, resonates with truth, feels pretty accurate and everything. And so what I finish up doing is saying to myself, all right, I'm on the divine love path and it's going really well. Like I process emotion, I feel better, a little law of attraction changes and it? it's wonderful. Process another emotion. And all of a sudden I get to this big causal emotion and now I haven't yet addressed the fact that I still was attracted to the natural love stuff back here for a reason, right? There's an emotional reason why I was attracted to this old stuff. And I haven't yet often dealt with that emotional reason why I found it attractive. Does that make sense? And so when I get to this big place, this big causal emotion, my first thought, because it's now getting really scary 
you know, I'm in this terror, basically, of getting into the emotion. And now my first thought is, let's go back to what I know works or what you th thought you know works, right? And, and so what we do is we revert out of that place of dealing with our emotions and try to go back to this intellectual way of processing. And because of this desire in me, I will then attract a group of spirits which will help me do that as well. So in that state, it's a, it's a, a very difficult state sometimes to get out of because I've really got to get through the co big causal emotion before I'll get out the other side. And on top of that, I have to deal with and address the emotional reason why I was attracted to the natural love path in the first place, which are often very much to do with wanting control of my life, wanting control of my emotions, wanting to feel safe and secure when I, you know, and all of those kind of issues all start coming up and popping up as a part of the process. So now, not only have I got this big causal emotion to deal with, I've now got all of these other reasons why I liked the natural love path coming up and hitting me in the face as well. The key is to allow your law of attraction to expose them to you and deal with them as they come. And if you can do that, you'll get through that period. If, though, you go into complete shutdown about this big causal emotion or you go and try to practice the things about the natural love path that you were doing before that used to work for you, you will actually find a period of high dissatisfaction so what will happen is you'll get down, you'll get a bit frustrated, maybe even angry. You'll get, you know, quite a lot of these kind of emotions will come up as a result. And in the end, once you really feel the divine love path, it's going to be very, very difficult for you get to get off it, no matter what emotional injury you have. Right? So even if you have the emotional injury of feeling attracted to natural love path for whatever reasons, eventually all of those injuries will leave you and in the end you you know uh, you'll notice when people are not being real with you on the natural love path and you'll go boy i used to like that you know i used to like that fake thing you know where everybody gives everyone a hug and says everything isn't it wonderful and 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 really i could feel that oh that, that person's right angry with me and that person's quite this with me and that person's angry with their mother and you know what i mean we start we start feeling the reality because we've dealt with a lot of our own emotions and as a result of that, no matter how uh, promising the natural love path appeals to us when we get to these big causal emotions, we eventually, we eventually go back there, test it out a bit more and often find it very disappointing because we've learnt so much since then. And that's, uh, so eventually you'll get through this phase where these spirits are connecting with you, mm. wa wanting you to stay with the natural love mm. stuff. Yeah. yeah, I'm very sure I'm not going back. <laughs> This is not a question. Yeah, yeah. I have another question. Sure. Um, I was sitting once in the car and we had the divine love music and I, I just got this strong desire coming from my heart to help dark spirits in the spirit world. Yep. It was overwhelming. I was crying and it was really strong. Yep. And looking back, where I come from, I'm from Germany, and yep. I'm born after the war. Yep. And all my relatives were Nazis. Yep. And I, all of a sudden, that really hit me. Yeah. Because I didn't know that. I just got to know it this year when I was in Germany. Yep. And I was, I don't know, something around that really started to touch me, and because I used to uh, have strong spirit connections, so I felt I'm. I have a very strong connection. To it would be a beautiful thing if you can help a lot of those people. Yeah. There, there are, from the Second World War and the First World War, there are still many, many yeah. millions of people in darkness in the spirit world and they need help from people. And the reason why they connect in particular to people who are of the same race is because they still have the racial hatreds and injuries that they had when they were on earth. So it's very, very hard for a Jewish person, for example, to help a Nazi in the spirit world, mm. right? Because that Nazi still has the same hatred towards mm. the Jews as they had when before they passed. Does that make sense? Mm. But it's much easier for a, for a German medium to help a Nazi in the spirit world mm. who's working their way through what's why they where they are. So it's a very powerful thing you can do to help others. And... I, mm. and um, what, what I want to do shortly is get back into developing some of these mediumship skill mm -hmm. sessions again mm -hmm. because, it, because it is so important to spend time helping these people. There are billions of them 
in the spirit world, literally, who need assistance. And the more mediums we can have who are willing to do that work and feel a joy in that work, it, it just has such a positive benefit on the planet. It's a, many of us have no idea how much spirits are connecting to us emotionally. And if we can help every one of those spirits who connects to us emotionally as well as ourselves, basically what you're doing is alleviating lots and lots of problems that come from the spirit world in terms of oppression on the earth. Mm. So it's very powerful if you can do that. I, 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 I feel there's a fear around that. I can yeah, so the key is for you to work your yeah, way through your fear. Part yeah. of your fear is you're afraid they'll attach to you in some way. And they were my relatives, yes. my grandfather, my yep. uncles. Yep. Yeah, and they are in dark places. Yeah, and so and you can help them. Yeah, yeah, and the beauty of many for many of these spirits is they they can see the truth immediately from what you tell them, whereas many people on earth can't. So so you'll be in a position where you can help tens of thousands of spirits when you might not even be able to help one person on earth, mm -hmm. because the spirits can instantly investigate what you're teaching them, whereas a person on earth finds that a lot more difficult. So. So it's very powerful to help these spirits. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Can we come down the front? Uh, yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, I was just wanting to know, um, can our physical bodies change with our emotional processing? Like when I was younger, I think I was about eight or nine months of age and I had a boil on my left bum cheek mm -hmm. and um, it was really bad and dad ended up instead of I don't know why they d my parents didn't take me to the doctor or anything but but my dad ended up squeezing all the pus out mm -hmm. so it actually um, a lot of the fat in my left bum cheek came out with that yeah. as well yeah. so I've got a big scar on my bum yeah. that I really don't like and <laughs> I'm really self-conscious about it. Yeah. So obviously I've got emotions to deal with that. Um, but I was just wondering, if I was to deal with those emotions, would that sort of change my, change the scar? Yeah, or totally. Really? Yeah, yeah. Well. But, but let's address some of the emotions first. And um, Firstly, there is a link between your dad doing that, the pain you felt and the reason why you still have the pain when you look at it in, on your bottom yourself. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So yeah. So the key is to look at the relationship. There is a relationship between your, your emotions from your father, the emotions you had about the event, and actually the boil itself is also a result of an emotion that was being suppressed in you as a child as well. Yeah, and also is, um, is it also to do with their emotions, the reason why I got it when I was that yes, age? Yes, very yeah. much so. Yeah. Very much so. Remember, the child is always reflecting... The emotions the parent denies. Yeah. So much sickness in a child is caused by emotions the parent is denying right at that moment. So what age were you? I think I was about eight or nine months of age. Right. So, so very very young. Yeah. Yep. And so there's got to be there's got to be quite a lot involved there. And also why your dad didn't take you to a doctor to get it removed. Yeah. There's also a lot in that emotionally for you. The key the key. With all of these emotions is to understand that once you release them, your body will heal. So I've had my body change markedly um, in the time that I've dealt with emotions and, and still is changing. Um, I find there are times when I get scars, like I am on the right leg at the moment. I'm injuring myself quite often on the right leg at the moment and it's all to do with how I'm viewing myself and the scars remain there and then as soon as I work my way through some issues the scars just disappear. Oh cool because right. I've got some scars on my legs that have been there for years yeah. and yeah. I don't so like them either. What eventually happens is your whole body will operate perfectly which also means that every cell in your body replicates perfectly. So instead of replicating with the injury in it, it replicates itself as a perfect cell structure as a result of dealing with the emotion. When you ha have the emotion inside of you, your body will continue to replicate based on the emotion that's stored. And this is why scars remain. Scars remain because what the, there's an emotion that created the scar in the location in the first place. That emotion itself, if it doesn't get released, actually creates the problem with the replication of the tissue, the, the cell structure. When So you, all of you know that with every seven years, basically, your cells completely renew, right? 
So if they completely renew, why do you have a scar after seven years? It's got to be because there's something else causing the scar and what's causing the scar is the emotion. So once the scar is produced, which is the law of attraction event to trigger the emotion anyway, once the scar is produced, what happens is that it will not release until you release the emotion. So the scar will t stay with you your entire life or it will release over time or it will completely disappear. It just depends when you deal with the emotion. So I've got a big scar here where I had an operation when I was two years of age on my bow. And, and I am right at the moment dealing with that emotion. And as I'm dealing with that emotion, this scar here is noticeably lightening and, and disappearing. right? But up until now, it's been there the entire time. But you can see it the entire time. And so the key is just allow these processes to continue understanding they're all emotions anyway. And if I focus on the emotion, all the physical stuff will right itself. Um, so Can I also address one other emotion? Yep. You want to also look good. So that's one of the emotions yeah. that you will need to address in this process. Yeah. Like uh, having an investment in looking good um, is also a judgment of when you look bad. So there's some judgment there from from somewhere in the past that yeah. you need to look at. Um, now I've just... Sorry. Oh, I've remembered it. Um, okay, so obviously any time like that I wear togs or anything, that triggers me because I think... Because oh, somebody can see the scar on your yeah. body. Yeah. Um, and sometimes when I walk past people, I think they're laughing at me or, you know, I've had that a few times and I... I always feel like other people can really notice it, but that's just because I notice it. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people tell me that they haven't even noticed it before. But yeah. um, So obviously it triggers me a lot. Sometimes I forget about it. Yeah. And um, But so because it does trigger me uh, a, a majority of the time... Um, but I'm not actually getting into the emotions, uh, how, how would I actually go about that? Like, would there be something else that would... When it does trigger you, what do you do? What, what's your feeling? Uh, well, it's really just judgment about myself. Like right, so you go into self-punishment. Yeah. So what, can you see what you're doing? You'd, yeah. You, you're going into punishment of yourself for having something. So you're in this place. Instead of feeling the grief. Instead of, of feeling yeah. this. So yeah. you're in punishment of this. So, so the first thing to do is to look at why you want to punish yourself. Mm. That's, a, that's an act of rage towards yourself. So that's an act of anger. So what you're doing is actually punishing yourself and that's an act of anger. So, so there's anger that's covering some fear you have about your body. Does that make sense? Yeah. So look at the fears and start letting yourself list the fears you have about your body and then get underneath those fears and what grief does that cover? And remember most grief is how I see myself. Mm. So there's something yeah. about how you're seeing yourself here that you're not prepared to grieve and instead you want to attack yourself for. Does that make yeah. sense? So allow yourself to grieve it rather than attacking yourself for it. And av as you do that, you will release a lot of the emotion. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also with boils, are they... Um, like... Do you attract boils because of anger? Is that what it is? It's yeah. deep suppressed rage and in the case of your age in your parents. Oh, okay. So yeah. And probably something related to that age in them as well. Yeah. So the age that you experienced at not eight years of age or nine years of age, something happened in their life that age that caused them. I actually had three on my bottom, uh, three oh, yeah. big boils and one big one on my chest when I was little and I used to get styes all the time, you know, those... And, and all of those ailments that I got, repeatedly got, were all a reflection of what I'm feeling that from the parents that the parents haven't released. Yeah. Okay, yep. cool, thank you. And can we go up the back? Yeah, yeah. Um, what about uh, birthmarks that come from, from birth? Are they...? Yeah. They're all healable. However, um, there's an emotion that came from the parents in the birthmark. And so it will be a multi-generational emotion that you'll need to address to heal it. Um, and many of those multi-generational emotions uh, pass down from generation to generation. The mark, the location of the mark will tell you a lot about the emotional injury. So if, it mo if the mark is on the head, it will tell you about uh, different types of injuries than if it's in the throat or the chest or the back or the bottom or the legs. And, and those, all of those are related to the parents' suppression of emotion. 
that now has entered you as a part of, you know, obviously gesta the gestation period of, in the womb. So the key is to allow yourself to use your intuition and pray about it if you want to get rid of them. But with all physical deformity, uh, with all physical effects, look sincerely also as to why you are so attached to releasing the effect. So if you have some kind of, you know, judgment of yourself about how you look and how you view yourself and how you view your body, one thing I've had to do is look at the really strong reasons within me as to why I want it corrected. Because when you look at why you want it to look different, you'll actually start seeing the emotion that created it. So what I've found for myself is I, I've started seeing the emotions creating some of the physical things in my body by just looking at my own dislike of them, if you like, my own judgment of them. And in my own judgment of them, I've eventually connected to the underlying emotional reason why that particular thing happened. Yeah. Hi, AJ. I came to see you just before Christmas. Yep. Your, last, your first one here is the first time I ever came. I went up and asked you a few questions and you gave me four things to look at, which I really appreciated very much. Yep. Went through a lot of growth, can appreciate everything you're saying now. Yep. I felt like I was being very false in who I was and closed down. Yep. And I actually went down to Victoria and was more of a real person. As I said before, I could feel what people were thinking. It wasn't judgments or anything. It, it had reached that stage. Yep. And I had got to it where I was closing off because yep. I didn't know what to do with it. Yep. I also had a situation with my family where something was happening with my niece. I wasn't told, and I was the only one out of the family not told. Yep. <laughs> when I went down for Christmas, I could see the parents were creating it, my sister and her husband. Yep. I saw my niece with the wild streak in her that I had. Yep. So I could really have that relation with her. Yep. Two things. My nephew became a drunken yobbo. Um, he's now getting a lot of trouble, in a lot of trouble with the law. Yep. My niece has been sent to a counsellor who wants to put her on depression tablets. Mm -hmm. She's just turned 15. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to put my judgments against what's right or wrong on the parents. Mm -hmm. I didn't condone what they were doing, so I removed myself. I yep. found it very, very difficult to not come from my heart and say anything because this is my um, issue at the moment and mm -hmm. a little bit of confusion. Everybody goes through what they need to at the time for their own growth and it could be down the track or down the future. We're not to judge that. What do I do though on a, either a metaphysical or a higher spiritual level? Some people say talk to their higher selves. <laughs> I don't know whether there's spiritual attachments or whether there it's their own growth. Yep. So at a distance, because now I'm back in Queensland and yep. they're in Victoria, yep. it's at a distance I'm just a little bit unsure of um, how, to, how to help where I'm not just sitting back going, look, I'm just removing myself from this. I yep. see it. I don't condone it. So you want to be able to assist, but, but you're not sure how to assist. Yeah, and I wasn't sure whether to sort of they've got any spiritual attachments because basically the parents have got exactly what they ask for. And because they turn around to me and say, you're not a parent, you haven't had children, you don't understand, they mm. also can't see the judgment on me where my reply now is, that now puts me in the best position to see what they're, what they're up to. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm an observer. Mm. I am not emotionally, emotionally attached. Mm. And because they are... Yep. She won't ask me because she's my sister. <laughs> okay, okay. And uh, yeah, I'm just a little bit. So the sure. issue is, firstly, that your sister and brother-in-law obviously don't want don't want uh, you to know what's going on in their family. No, my parents have told me, and yep. I just said it doesn't alter my love for my yep. niece and nephew, but it does put me in a quandary as to do I just walk away and go leave it, or can I help on more of a spiritual level? Yeah, well, you always can help on a spiritual level, so we'll discuss that separately. But let's look at, firstly, what's going on emotionally for the children. Um, by the way, whenever you as a parent say to another person who's never been a parent, you haven't been a parent, so you can't tell me what to do, you're actually judging the person because they might be in a position to be actually help, be able to help you. So for a start, don't judge a person just because they haven't been a parent. That is a judgment and all judgments are unloving, right? All judgments are made 
to prevent you from feeling your own emotion. So when you judge somebody, if somebody comes to you and tells you something about parenting and they've never been a parent and you judge them, you're judging them to stop feeling one of your own emotions. That's, that's the first thing. So that's what your sister and, brother-in-law, uh, sister and brother-in-law are doing, right? Just preventing you from, from saying something to them because they actually feel judgment with themselves and they, and they instead would like to judge you rather than feel that feeling within themselves. The second thing is that children always are the result of this reward and punishment system that goes on in, our ch- in their childhood. So if our children have emotional problems uh, by the time they're 15 and we send them along to a counsellor of some kind and we refuse as a parent to deal with our emotional issues, then we're not helping our children at all, in fact. And in fact, what we're doing is we are blaming our children for their response to our own emotional injuries because what they're feeling right at that moment is the response to our emotional injury. So it's a very damaging thing to actually send a child along, blaming them for my emotional injuries, to send them along to some kind of counsellor, put them on medication or whatever. And also the fact that my son or daughter is drinking a lot or taking drugs and what, that is also a complete reflection of something that I've created inside of myself as a parent. And while their reaction to it is probably very self-harming, I need to look at what inside of me created that inside of them. Most parents who have children abusing themselves in some way do not want to look at themselves. And they always want to blame the child for the condition they're in. And this is something that all of us need to address if we're in that state where we've got children who have trouble. They have trouble because of what we have done to suppress them. Now, the way in which we suppress them is not always overt. In other words, it's not always abusive, like physically uh, or sexually abusive. It can be very abusive from an emotional level. It can even be something like, so simple, like, do whatever I want to make me happy. So, so if a child is very sensitive and I'm projecting at the child constantly to make... To be, for me to be happy, you need to do what I want. That is a huge damaging emotion that I'm placing on that child. Now, ch- most children growing up will go into two states under that condition. They will go into rebellion, outright rebellion. In other words, they just get angry and upset and get, you know, get quite rageful with me and with others and often not with me as the parent because, because they want my love. So they'll get rageful with others and not me as a result of that. Or they go into this other state which is abusing alcohol or drugs because they feel so sad and they don't want to feel that sadness. Right? So that's the main cause there of what's going on. Now, the question is how can we help them remotely? Uh, very difficult to help a person, help people in this state remotely aside from prayer. And what prayer is, is a longing that you direct to God that these particular people can start to learn some things or be attracted to ask you questions about their condition. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does because my my niece had always wanted me to go around for tea and my sister has always said another time, even when I lived there. And it was funny because I haven't spoken to them for ages and yet Gemma's apparently been dead set serious and said, I'm going to live with Auntie Sue which floored everybody, even me, because yeah. I hadn't Seen learned it, it. But it was yeah. by being a bit more distant. And I had to do a lot of processing about my anger and hurt when I was told I don't want her knowing and she doesn't have to know anything. Now, she doesn't know a lot of my background or even what I've been through with my um, friend and ex-partner yeah. with his children. So, again, I was in the perfect position to help her, but... I had to do a lot of processing about my hurt and anger to let that go. And can I just address that for a moment? There is a big law of attraction, so your law of attraction, between yourself as the auntie and your niece. How do you spell niece? I-E-C-E. And your niece. A big law of attraction. I can actually really see myself in it, which is why I laugh at her, because she's got such that wild streak that I had. Yeah, but let's go deeper than that. How your niece has been treated by her parents 
is a reflection of how you have been treated by your parents. So whatever you are angry about, about how the parents treat your niece, is actually really about how your own parents have treated you that's yet to be healed. Does that make sense? It does now. As soon as you said that, yeah, I can, I can relate to that because I had a lot of grief because when I was a lot younger, I was always very um, spiritual and honoured divine path and luckily I had my nan and my sisters always thought, you know, that we were in the twilight zone and yep. the things that we could do and the same with my, my dad. Yep. And they actually sent me to a psychiatrist when I was younger can and you I see can relate the relationship? to the pressure. Mm. Can you see what's going on between yourself and your niece? I can now. I she gets seen sent that. to a... <laughs> You get sent to one. A lot, there's a lot of patterns here. And if you can look at it as your law of attraction to help you deal with some of your parent emotions, it, it will be great for you too. So everything you hear about what's happening with your niece that you're feeling about, look at what's going on for you with your own relationship with your parents and allow yourself to start processing through some of those emotions. In fact, that's the way, the best way for you to help your niece. Okay. You see what I'm saying? The yeah, I do. It took me a lot of years to process that, and I, but it made me the person that I am. And when I went to see a psychiatrist, a psychologist, yep. he turned around and you know we had a good chat, and he just went, "Most of the other people you're dealing with are a, a bit nuts. You know, you're okay." And it was as I always used to say for many, many years, "Is this normal? Is this normal?" Until somebody said to me many years later, "What's normal?" What's normal yeah. And I, I realized then that by what they did and my nan tried to make light or my dad sort of said oh the doctor just referred you because we didn't know what to do with you which happens with a lot of spiritual children yeah they don't know what to do with so they just call them weird put them into and we're talking you know we're talking sort of 40 odd years ago yeah um when people didn't know so and that instead of continuing the story can we stop the story for a yeah. moment and um, let's always get back to this Everything that's upsetting you with your niece is actually what you're really upset about with your parents. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you can focus on that, what will happen if you can heal this within yourself, that is uh, going to have a huge effect on your niece. Your niece is going to feel more and more attracted to getting that assistance from you. But you can't really help her until you work through this issue with your parents that's being triggered by your niece's parents, your sister. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I so, can see that. So if you can you. focus on that first, then you will be able to help this situation quite a lot. At the moment, you're going to have lots of judgment towards the parents automatically. Yeah. The reason why is because there's this unhealed emotion towards your own parents and they look the same to you. Does that make sense to you? And while they look the same to you, you're going to have the same judgments at them. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Thank you. I yeah. hadn't looked at that. Thank you very no much. No worries. <laughs> Thanks for your time, guys, today. Enjoy your evening. <laughs>